everybody, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been hosting a series of webinars during the pandemic, which I had no idea was going to last this long, but it's really been a blast, and I so enjoy all of my guests. Um, I've had all different kinds of people, and Laura's been a guest. This is her third webinar, I believe, um, Sharon Wilsey, and I have some really great guests lined up coming up soon. For my hundredth, we're gonna have a very special guest, so stay tuned for that. And if you are not getting the emails that tell you all about the guests coming up each week, you can go to murdochmethod.com and sign up for my newsletter. I put out the newsletter every weekend and it has all the links for you to sign up and links from the previous webinars, which are all available on my Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Today, my guest is Laura Plunkett, again. So, so nice to see you. Um, and I'll let Laura do a little introduction about uh, her background and what she does for those of you who don't know Laura. And then we're gonna talk about working with a shutdown horse, which I think is a really important topic because a lot of times I think horses that are really quiet sometimes are misconstrued and they're really not present. So welcome Laura, thank you so thank much you. for joining me today. By way of introduction, I will say I'm really happy to see that my dad has just joined us. Hi dad. Um, <laughs> Mom and dad were so instrumental in me loving animals my whole life, taking me camping, having wounded animals and hurt animals and nursing them back to health. Um, but my background in animal communication started maybe, oh boy, almost 30 years ago. I just realized I was getting more and more intuitive and started working with that skill. And then, um, and also I've been riding all my life. So my interest really right now is in the equine animal communication. And today I'm really excited to talk about, you know, how fate sort of leads you in a certain direction. And certainly in the last couple of years, I've had the chance to have some relationships with really shut down horses and see the evolution of what's possible. So I was really excited today to turn my attention to this one type of problem horses can have and see what we can put together for the hour. Very excited about that. Um, we've done other webinars. We did how to help your animal during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about animal communication and how to do it and about my mini course and things like that. So go to Wendy's website and you can look at those two for that kind of stuff. Um, and let's see, anything I left out? No, I just forgot to say that this is my garden. These are autumn amaryllis. Um, ah. Jinx Fox gave me a bunch of these when I went over and harvested bulbs from her house. And this year they are absolutely glorious. So um, in spite of the heat, because it's wickedly been, it's we've had like over 60 days, over 90 and above 70 at night. So it's been yeah. really quite unpleasant here in Virginia. Um, but I love my flowers, so they're doing great. All right, awesome. So what I'm gonna do is talk about sort of my perspective quickly about shut down horses and then hopefully you'll chime in and um, we can talk a lot more about it. And then I've got a whole bunch of stories that I thought would be fun. And if you have questions as we're going through things, just put them in the chat, right, Wendy? And then- um, we'll get to what they, can the, they can use the Q&A to also ask questions or the chat. Okay, great, all right. So I actually looked up shut down the definition as I was getting ready for this today. And it said to settle so as to obscure vision, to close in. Let me put this whole oh, thing wow. that I'm talking about right on the screen share. Okay. So you can look at it. I thought that was very interesting because as we talk about what is a shutdown horse, this idea of closing in is how it shows up. So you might have a horse that is, people say, oh, he's bomb proof. Um, and when I say you have one, a lot of times the clients I work with, they have rescue horses, um, they have horses that have been through a lot and have just, um, have just purchased them. And so some of this can be from the past and all of a sudden you're noticing it. So they're sold as bomb proof. Um, but what it really means is that they have learned how to freeze instead of use flight. Um, they seem to be just going through the motions they don't relate to people when given the choice. So oftentimes very obedient. If you have the halter on, we'll do what you ask under saddle. But if you put them at liberty in a round pen or you give them the choice in a paddock, they, and I'll show you some pictures of just standing um, tail to you wanting to leave. 
Another trait is that, that I have noticed is they do tighten their jaw or cheek muscles when you approach. So there's not any overt aggression, but it just, you have to look closely to realize they don't want you there. There's no playfulness, curiosity, or sparkle. Um, they're not reactive. They're not overly aggressive. But I would say the general thing that I find is they have a lack of hope for their relationship with their owner. And, and just to be clear, sh shutdown can happen in any mammal. In other words, yeah. it's not unique to horses. And these things that you're describing are the same things that we see in people, in dogs, in other animals, in you know, animals that might be in a confined situation. Um, so this is not unique to horses. It's really mammalian traits that we're talking about. And, um, and we're gonna probably at some point bring up the vagus nerve because so many of these things are relating back to the concept of the polyvagal theory and vagus nerve. But I just want people to realize that, you know, there are many people right now, and this is, I just read an article recently with the pandemic, that people are starting to shut down because it's lasting so long. That's right. And so, you know, these, these characteristics are not unique to horses and we can identify them in ourselves and hopefully um, have more skills to deal with that if we're personally experiencing that, experiencing that now, especially during the pandemic. I love that you said that. Um, and, I, and I think the lack of hope in people is what we're seeing also, right? Because as it continues, people are losing that initial burst of I can get through this, we'll be fine. So I'm, I, I'm gonna, I wrote what I, what I think causes it. I'm sure there are other things also, but when I looked back at the horses I've talked to, there are some themes. Um, one, to, one is long-term physical pain, especially if it hasn't been recognized. And, you know, horses know when we're trying to treat them, right? So if they have a pain and you've got a vet and you're, and you're putting that um, abscess into, into a soak, they know you're trying. But if you haven't shown any signs that you notice they're in pain, um, that's where I would say the long-term physical pain is the worst for them. Uh, learned helplessness. We've talked a lot about this, you and I personally. One uh, horse I'm working with right now, that overwork, what I mean by that is if you're a cart horse and you've just got to trot, 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 and there's no way out of it and you get the whip if you don't trot, that is what I would call overwork. Um, doesn't matter how tired you are or sore. And then the other kind is just your needs not being met. So if you just can't control, you know, anything in your environment and, you know, a lot of the horses I talk to, they've had periods of time where they're not getting water regularly or they're not getting food. Um, and they just shut down from that. Now this one, the next one, having multiple owners or riders um, and also being sent to multiple trainers, some of the most well-meaning owners who say, okay, so I sent him to this trainer, then I sent him to that trainer. Horses sometimes misunderstand and they think you're shopping them around. It's amazing how many horses have said to me, Is, are they gonna send, who are they sending me to next to buy me? So that's just something that you're not trying to do in a negative uh, way, but can be misunderstood. And then lots of trauma. We can talk more as I go into different stories. Anything and, to add and to that? You can even include, lot. Well, before you scrolled up, go back, go back. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can include lo loss of a friend. I mean, horses do grieve. And yeah. I've seen that. And so I think that that should not be underplayed and could be included as a, as a trauma. Um, and in terms of learned helplessness, this is actually a very specific term. Um, and, and there's been research done many years ago um, where they did experiments. Um, the classic one is that there's a dog with a, with a metal grate under its feet that can be electrified. And the dog jumps, they electrify it and he jumps to the other side of the pen and they electrify it and he jumps back. But when he can't get relief, if they electrify, and I know this sounds like a horrible experiment, this was done quite a while ago, but it is the classic experiment for learned helplessness, that there's no relief, that it doesn't matter which side he's on, he's gonna get an electric shock, not, not a killing shock, but you know, an electric shock. Yeah. Um, the dog shuts down. So learned helplessness is actually, um, there's been a lot of research done on it in other animals, but I don't know that we've really done it I, and I can't say for sure whether there's actually been research done on learned helplessness in horses. I haven't come across any, but right. certainly there are plenty of horses with it. 
Right, and one of the things we have to think about there is if we look at the evolution of horses in society, um, and in some places they're still work animals, they're beasts of burden, um, they're, they're, they have, we have evolved and kept our horses with us and it's become, uh, you know, a pet, an associate, a friend, a companion, um, and someone we ride, but um, the, coming from the work ethic, there's a lot of, if you think back and you think back to the way this country was founded with covered wagons and people going across the country, everybody was harder then. Everybody just kind of grit their teeth and marched on because that's what they did. And so we have to look at how, how use of horses has evolved and whether or not the training of horses and the care of horses and the well-being of horses has actually evolved sufficiently to the level of um, uh, emotional support that we want from our horses now. Love that, yep. Well, that goes right into the relationship and how to help, what to do if you do find yourself now um, as the owner of a horse like this, mm -hmm. Multi sometimes multiple horses like this if you've rescued a whole bunch. Um, so I put aside, I put down a list that I thought we could just run through and then we'll get into more when we, when I go to the photos and when we're talking. Um, one of the things I think is so vitally important is this thing of breathing deep with our horses, letting go of an agenda and just putting yourself, giving yourself the time to really meet them where they are. I put, uh, you'll see throughout this, I put people's names, including yours, Wendy, in parentheses. So if people want to look further into these ideas, um, these are wonderful people to reference for it and lots, there's lots of resources uh, online. So one of the most amazing things that happens for me when I meet a horse like this, because I do and make the time for it, is I walk up to the point where their bubble meets mine. And so you can take a moment and you let a horse be at liberty and then you watch them and you'll see they will show you where their boundary is and where they're comfortable. And if you give them a chance to, if you stop when you see their ears go back, their, their jaw tighten, uh, their posture change, their, their butt gets really tight, uh, then you've given them a gift that most people have not in their history given them. So I also, this thing about giving liberty and choice, and in this, I, I say whenever possible, this, I know you, everybody's got to deal with their horse and get certain things done, but this is an opportunity to take a half hour, an hour out of, out of your day and let your horse loose and have an experience with them, which then allows them to see you as something different than what they've experienced before. So I put, <laughs> uh, I'm going to use my story with Lily very soon. Lily is a, is a horse that I'm working with currently. And one of the first things I did with her is just get a fly whisk out. And when she would show me that a fly was bothering her by twitching, I would be the one uh, to get rid of that fly because she was so uninterested in me that I had to desperately show her that I had some value. The other thing is that I, I, she wouldn't greet me, you know, in the general, you put your uh, fist out and they'll they'll bring their muzzle she had no interest in any kind of greeting so I finally got to the point where uh, I taught her that if she would greet me I would reach under the fence and get tons of grass for her and and hand it to her so then she got interested in me for the first time same thing with hay out of a hay net so it's easier to get to and I mentioned mirroring because that is just letting your body move when they move looking at what they're looking at I learned a lot about it from Andrea Wadey and it works miracles with a shutdown horse because they realize that whatever they're doing is actually affecting you in some way, uh, which they're not used to. And then, you know, you and I have talked about all the signs of lick and chew, yawning, breathing deep. And you'll see that after the horse has realized something new is happening in your relationship, um, they do all of these things if you give them time. So it's taking a lot of pauses. And then when you've gotten to the point where they'll actually comfortably let you get closer, uh, which can take time. Uh, then Wendy, with the vagus nerve, your sure foot pads, I have a great video of that. Um, I have a video of, of Lily letting me finally groom her in a way that she enjoyed. I have you and I doing energy work and, and a few holds that people can do. There's always massage. I have a picture of the Beamer mat. And we'll talk some about animal communication, what a difference it can make. 
And then finally, and I'm sure you have some stuff that you do also, um, but I've been finding that these horses that are so good, um, in quotes, some of what they don't have is really good training. And so um, in the case of Lily, you know, she's trying to do the right thing. It just makes her tense. She doesn't know what you're really asking. She was a cart horse and now she's a therapeutic riding horse. So going back to the basics of just letting her see that when I ask her to move forward with a halter or with the bridle turned to the left and then let her lick and chew and learn it, she's getting comfortable and learning how to be good without getting tense. You know, it, it brings up the thing of, of what, there's three things that are really critical to, to, to a horse and, and its condition, also people. And, and we oftentimes don't recognize that so often there's a lack of understanding that, and this is with people too. And, you know, I, you know, there's so many times when I've uh, worked with people and I had, a, in some cases, I've had people that were deaf or very hard of hearing. And they would stand super close to me while I was teaching. And it would be so annoying to me because they were invading my bubble. And I felt like, get out of my bubble. And then they would finally tell me, you know, I, I'm, I'm three quarters deaf and I can't hear. So I'm just trying to come. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, I, I understand that you're not crowding me to make my life miserable. You're trying to get close enough so that you can hear what I'm saying because you're so interested and you want to learn. And if you don't hear what I'm saying, you can't understand. Yeah. And so I think you're right. So often there's the horses have a lack of understanding and they either, in addition to that, have pain or fear. And those three things, lack of understanding, pain, and fear are what causes horses to have to shut down. Um, but that's the same thing in people, yeah. right? I mean, again, it's the same thing that when there's, when you don't understand what's happening, just, uh, you know, like um, think about walking into a movie halfway through and you're trying to figure out what the plot is and there's really high action and you don't know who the bad, you know, who's the value, who's, you know, like I, last night, Brad was watching a movie and I sat down, <laughs> you know, and I was, it was a funny spy movie, but I couldn't figure it out because I didn't know who, it, who was what. So I think a lot of times we, and I've heard people say this so often, my horse should know better. Yes. Right? My horse should know better. And it's why should, why should your horse know better? Um, this could be entirely, he might be smelling something that he didn't smell before. His eyesight is different. He might be seeing it before. But we instantly go to, he knows better and he should do what I want because I told him 10 times already and he should do better. Right? So we jump the gun on our storyline. And then of course, if we add pain or fear, we're just compounding that and taking them further away from being able to learn. And they're going to have to, in some way, cope with that. Whether yes. that's flight, shutdown, you know, reaction, yeah. you know, aggression, they're going to have to cope with that in some way. And I think that um, a lot of what you're saying is take more time and check. That's right. Um, I was going to, I'm going to switch our order because what you're saying right now feeds so well into this picture. Let me find it. I want to show you something. So this is Lily. She's a gypsy banner. Oh no, wait, I have to, have is to that screen it. sharing? No, you have to go to the green button and hit share screen and then. That would help. <laughs> All right. There we go. So and if, Lily, um, you can diminish your screen on the side there so we have more screen. Do you, yes, you're, on your left-hand side, we see all of your files. If you just diminish that, you can just drag it across. If not, it's okay. Diminish. So it's all right. We're just getting to see all your files. You're showing your dirty laundry. Ooh. <laughs> Does that make it better? Uh, hasn't changed it. My, there, that's better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So this is just what you're talking about. And I remember your conversation with Dr. Stephen Peters, where he told you that chemically, when children or horses are overwhelmed with adrenaline and cortisol and all those things, they can't learn, right? So it feeds right in to what you said about, well, I've tried it 10 times. Well, if you've tried it 10 times while your horse is afraid, they cannot learn. Right. So here's Lily, who was a cart horse, who turned into a therapeutic riding horse just she hasn't been there for that long at Misty Meadows Therapeutic Riding Center. And 
we, I decided to go back to basics because when you're on her and you ask her to turn left, her whole, her face, her neck and her shoulder all go left in a line. If you can imagine a cart horse doing that, right? She just veers over. So what I realized is I got her really soft and comfortable and then tried this exercise. Is that playing for you? Yep. Really slow. And the first couple times I did this, this was impossible for her. But this is probably the fourth or fifth different day that this is how we started out. And now she gets it. And so you literally did not ask this much in the beginning, I would assume. Just the tiniest hint of her reacting to the touch of the bit against this. If she would give it all, then I would release. Yep. But we got to this point, and then I just want to go right into the next one. Because as soon as I did that, I stopped to let her process. And the person filming, um, said, oh my goodness, we have to catch this because she yawned twice and then we got the last two, which made four yawns of her processing, just being able to successfully do that and know what I was talking about, know what I was asking for. Look at that huge breath and tail flick. If, yep. um, if, you, if you grab your video bar and just move it back. Um, yep. And then just, yep slowly take it forward and you're gonna see no just yep right there just that way use your bar here's our yawn right our huge yawn there's a little tail swish there's the bigger yawn right the and, two. Tail swish and the eyes blinking and the processing and the tail swish and sharon talks about the tail swish being like a, it's gone all the way through and so you've got from front to back in that So that really, um, that just is allowing her in a calm space to get the information that we want her to have, right? And now when I'm riding her, she's soft with the bridle, her head is down. I have some more video of that, but I'm just saying that it didn't take very much to get to a much more comfortable place in her body as she so, moves. So, so uh, you know, I, I, we're on the same page here. And what I often talk about is with riders as well as horses, is that if you only have, say, a, a, in the alphabet, you only have a P, an A, a Q, and an S, and I ask you to spec, spell walk, you don't have the letters to do it. You don't have W-A-L-K. And so if we think about learning language, like human language, right, and go back to the position of being a child, we, have, we start with our letters. We don't start with paragraphs and sentences. We start yes. with just A, B, C. And then we start combining cat, C-A-T, right? And so this yes. is rain, R-E-I-N, means T-U-R-N, your H-E-A-D. They're all single syllable words, right? Super simple. Yes. And what I love about Misty is they realized, so she had arrived and she's settling in, but they realized she had past trauma. She had uh, learned helplessness and she had physical issues for a long time. And so they called me and said, would you spend time with her and do this? So I felt really moved that I could be part of it. Should I start with some well, more? Let me just say that these horses, especially these part draft horses, are often interpreted as being stubborn, stupid, <sighs> slow, and yeah. ignorant. And that's when, when we think the horse should understand and he's not getting the message or doing what we ask, we then start to label these horses. And the problem with putting labels on them is that those labels will then go through a barn and that horse is pigeonholed into being stupid or slow or lazy or whatever term you want to use that really is indicative of this horse is not engaged and present and active with us. But it's, it's so common and, I, and sadly so common that we uh, especially in a barn setting, not Misty, because they're all there about EAL and therapeutic, and that's what they do with their horses and their riders. But in many, say, riding barns, um, if a horse is not on the program and not fitting in or is a little bit different or a little bit less quick, they get these labels very quickly, and then the whole barn keeps that horse stuck in that idea. Yes. All right. That leads me... 
to this picture. All right. I'm going to indulge myself for a minute because for two, for two times, the last two talks, I talked about Hunter. So some of the people watching will remember that this horse um, was, a, was a jumping lesson horse for 15 years. No abuse that we know of in his past. He doesn't show any, but tons of learned helplessness because he had a different rider every hour. Um, and he had a lot of lameness when we met him and he wanted nothing to do with me. So I told his story in the last two. And at the end of the last two, I said, does anyone want him? Because he lost his owner due to COVID. He lost his, the woman leasing him and the owner was going to have to find something for him. But here is his, his person leasing him again. She was able to um, recover from what was going on with COVID and come back. And he, you can see how soft he is with her. And then this speaks to, okay, so he was, he had to leave that lesson program. He had uh, bucked a bunch of people off and he had actually, someone had broken their femur falling off of him and they decided he was unrideable. Um, he worked to walk trot, but every time I, with a halter, we, we just gave up on it. We never wanted another bit in his mouth because he was so sour from that. But here's a, here's a bridleless, bitless bridle. Um, and, but we did all agree he'd never canter because you go to canter him and he bucks like a Bronco. He just was so uncomfortable and uneven and um, didn't want to be pushed. So I just got this video of him. So this is where you said horses get pigeonholed, right? So they gave him away for free because they said he'll never be worth, he can't, he can't do anything. And watch this, so without a bit. <laughs> Sorry for the video. The, it's okay. Um, but anyway, soft, easy, and not doing what they had expected once he had some time to get comfortable again. Just play it again, okay, and hopefully it'll catch up a little bit. Oh, is it going slower? Yeah. Uh oh. But if you just, just play it again, it might catch up. Sometimes it will. Okay. Yep. But the bottom line is this is a horse that was pigeonholed into never cantering again. And here he is cantering quietly and happily with his owner. Because his, his owner and the woman leasing her, who you see him, who you see riding him, both took the time to do all the things we're talking about. And look at his ears are up and you can see that he's bright. It's beautiful. So I, I wanted to, um, let's, let's start at the beginning and as chat questions come in, we can address them. But here's Lily when I first met her. You, she would do anything you want if you had a halter on her. The minute you took it off, um, all she wanted to do was, if she had a choice, she didn't want anything to do with anyone. And this is Jasper, another horse. I just wanted to show, this is what shut down to my mind looks like. He came from a sale barn. He was number seven. Um, he had had no real attention. And this was, this is it. This is all he would do if you let him. Did that run okay? Yep. And, it, you know, some people would look at that and go, oh, what a nice trick. I can put a hula hoop on my horse's nose. But really what you're seeing here is a horse that is so dull and so dead inside that he's not even going to react to it. And you can see by his neck posture and his facial expression, even though it's at a funny angle, that he's, he's really just checked out. Yeah. You could do... Now here is when I learned um, how to work with Mustangs that had been wild and then adopted and then abused and rescued. <laughs> it's a long yeah. sentence. Um, this is Tyson. And this is a horse that had been through an enormous amount of stress and um, some abuse, but he did not get shut down. And so I just wanted to show you what I feel is the difference of what you'll see. So here's me trying to get him used to things. So I got in the hay feeder, still curious, Still interested, ears forward, wondering, right? He's responding to his environment, trying to learn. So friend is coming over too. <laughs> yeah. All right. That brings us, I just wanted everyone to see a happy, happy outcome on one of these animal communication talks that I've had. This is Will. He was a national champion Morgan. I went down to Wendy State of Virginia. And okay, we're not seeing it right now. You might have to unshare and reshare. We just have a still shot of his butt. 
It's still a, sh I didn't do anything yet. That's oh. right. Um, he, they asked me to talk to him because he seemed so depressed and shut down. And when they tried to do anything with him, um, especially in the indoor on at Liberty or with a halter, he basically just stood around and, and they couldn't figure out how to get any kind of happiness from him. He also had high anxiety. So if he wore different gloves in to clean his stall, it would set him off. So I talked to him and, and he, he said- he was retired at this point too though, right? What? Will was retired at this point when you met him. I mean, it wasn't, he wasn't, I met him when he was still under saddle and he was a very interesting high strung horse to work with a neck that was straight up in the air. And we worked with him and, and he still knows my voice if I walk in, but, um, but he was retired and, and yet lost his joy for life. And I think that's really, it wasn't that, I mean, he was, he's got the best of care where he lives. Yes. People really adore him. There are other horses. He's turned out with other horses. He has what we would think of as, uh, what is it? The Hotel California where you come and you never leave and there's rescue horses there. So it's, he, but he's come from a life that was a high stress show life in his past. Perfect. And I think too, when he talked to me, um, there was an element that talks to that lack of hope because I think he had always been in partnership in high partnership with a person, right? With competing. And here he is sort of turned out. He wasn't showing interest in his stable mates or pasture friends. And so that's why they want it. So anyway, he said, the answer to all of this is I want to play soccer in the indoor. Please bring this green ball in and let me play. And I'll be able to play with, his, with um, Pam's son, Hank. And this was the first moment that they made it possible. They let him loose. They thought he would be terrified of the ball. <laughs> and he's been in this indoor many times and not done this is the other thing you need to realize. That's um, right. Nothing. Yep. And if you can hear him, he's snorting. I think he's showing off. He got his wish. Yeah. He, I think he can't believe it. And this is me taking the video. So you'll see he looks over at me. I think he can't believe his luck that he told me. And then he actually got his wish. Yep. And a huge lick and chew. Yeah. And they thought he would never touch this ball, right? Oh, you told me that earlier before we got started. Yeah. Pam said she thought, you know, um, because, as I said, he was afraid of everything. Just play that video again because it's really fun. So, well, so I'm going to go watch this one. This is the second half of it. Oh, okay. This is the same moment. And again, they, they thought he would never engage with that ball. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> Not shut down anymore. Well, and it's so fascinating because you know, it's, it's not at the ball, really. It's, it's just awoken his play. Okay, one more. This is the next day. I, w I had flown back to Boston, but they had played with him for 20 minutes. This is him. <laughs> wow. You know, and I've taught horses to play soccer, but he's a natural soccer player. Nobody <laughs> taught him a thing. He just did this all on his own. <laughs> you know, and, and I've seen horse, I've seen people with balls interacting with horses, but this is really, really different because so often we're trying to get the horse to engage, but this horse has chosen. He told you he wanted a ball and he's yes. chosen to engage with this without human uh, encouragement, if you will, That's or right. without having to be taught so so i i think this is super fascinating and it it kind of makes me ask the question of how do we figure out 
what our horses are going to be curious about. Like, I mean, he told you, so you knew, you had a hint. But when we, when we have horses, how do we figure out what is going to help them be more interactive in a positive way, not an aggressive way, not a fearful way, but in a way that is actually pleasant. Because then the reason I say that, I, I see a lot of people interact with their horses in Liberty work and they say, oh, my horse is having fun. And when I look at that horse, I go, this horse is stressed and feeling chased. And so there's this very fine line that is not always an easy read for people between yes something we're doing to the horse and something the horse is choosing to do. Well, let me put in my plug for animal communication at this point, because I, I truly believe everyone can do it. And I think it's the quickest way. I mean, it really helped me with Lily. I'll talk a little more about her. It gave me Will's answer in 10 minutes or less. Um, and I think everyone can. I have the mini course on my website, LP Connections. And I think that's really... Um, worth pursuing for anyone that feels they have any interest in it because I'm getting a lot of positives from the people using that mini course now that they're getting a lot of results. So um, that's one way. And I do think the curiosity, Wendy, of, of paying attention, what do they look at? What do they seem to like? And actually, let me show you another. Let's go back to the pictures. Hmm. Um, you might have to, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay, you'll figure it out. Um, but that, you know, and this is, again, this is something when I watched Julian Benyon with his Liberty work, um, and we've done a, we've done a webinar with Julian. He uh, formerly was with Cavalia. And, and again, it's this difference between the horse going through the motions and the horse really present and engaged. And you can see that it's truly enrichment, not just making my horse do this. And I, and I think that that's a difficult line for people to recognize. Yes. Does that, do you see this now? Yep. Okay. So here's Lily again. I want everyone to see she's totally compliant, but look at her ears. Look at her manner. Yeah, very unhappy, ears pinned, you know, like um, trotting because she knows she has to. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the unhappy face kind of tells us a lot, doesn't it? Yes. So I had this communication with her. I started putting her in this round pen. The thing is, the first couple times, I couldn't even get her to look at me like this. She would just stand sort of with her head down or looking out. Um, but as we went along, you can see here, her, she told me that she had had two different traumas. One was as a cart horse, where you can see this whip that I've got leaning across her right now. Um, I didn't do it in a desensitization way. I just carried it around way on the other side of the pen, and then I would leave it laying down. And eventually she got so that she could stay really soft and have it resting against her. Um, the other thing with Lily is that she told me she had had a birthing trauma. She had been a happy, um, sparkly, love to be messed with and have her, have her mane braided. And then she had gotten pregnant on a breeding farm, which we then verified with the past um, owner. And she said in her time of need, when she was laying there in pain, giving birth, this man came up to her with a metal crazy thing that I saw in my head and ripped the baby out of her and ripped her open and that she hasn't trusted people since. So I was speaking to the vet that works at Misty and I said, can you tell me what this could have been, the thing? And she said, oh, it was a forceps. And so the baby must have been breached and they saved her life um, by doing this, but she didn't know. So that's the animal communication part I was able to add. But let's go, here's pads. Can we, well, can we back up for just one second though? Because I think it's super important that we define the difference between desensitization and learning. Please. And so, you know, I hear people all the time saying, oh, I've desen I'm gonna desensitize my horse or I wanna desensitize my horse or I have, I have done it. And in my opinion, if you are doing what you say, you're simply shutting your horse down. You are not 
teaching your horse anything you're teach other than to tolerate the experience as long as you continue it. And I think it's really important to understand this distinction because I look at what I want to do is to educate my riders and my horses and my animals. I want them to learn. I want them to be good learners and learn how to learn. And one of the keys there is that you do something and then you give them a rest and you let them process it. But if you keep pushing on them and doing, say, and for example, sacking out, taking a blanket and just repeatedly sacking the horse with a blanket until the horse doesn't flinch anymore. You've literally put the horse into shutdown because there's no escape from the sacking. There's no escape from being hit with the blanket. And so the horses learn to tolerate that experience, but they haven't learned that it's an okay experience. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that at some point in time, that shutdown is going to have to either be resolved or you will never have a horse that's really present and engaged with you when you're working with it. And so, you know, I, I really want to emphasize this point because I hear this term all the time, oh, I've desensitized my horse. And when I hear that, it's like, oh, you've shut your horse down. You've taught him that no matter what, he has to tolerate this experience. The problem with that is that when you want your horse to be a good learner and be engaged, he will not be there for you. Yes. And so let's look at teaching anything. And this is, you know, like, I've often said to people, I can, I can teach somebody almost anything because I know how to teach. And in teaching, the key is to give a piece of information and allow that piece of information to process. And process requires time. Whether that's like when I work with a student under saddle and I put my hands on and I make an adjustment to the pelvis, and then I tell them to go for a walk and experiment going back and forth between the old place and the new place, so that the student understands the change, that it's nothing that they're trying to do to please me, but that it makes a difference to them. And with our horses, to make, if we want them to be good students, we have to give them that option to choose a little bit, but we also have to present the concepts in a way that is without pain and without fear so that they can be present to learn. And here we are back to vagus nerve, the number one question, because a horse is constantly aware of its environment, is, am I safe? And if yes. you're threatening that horse by sacking it out with a blanket, then you're saying you're not safe and you have to tolerate this and it's going to happen as long as I choose that it's going to happen and you're just going to have to stand there and take it. Yes. But if we establish that, and that does not mean disrespect. In other words, it doesn't mean that we have, the horse can invade my boundaries. But if we, with respect toward the horse, mm -hmm. say, let me show you this blanket and I let them smell it and then I remove it so they can process, oh, that was interesting, what did that smell like? And I do that a few times or I take it and I swipe it down their neck and then I remove it and say, let them go, wow, well, that didn't bother me, that was okay and I have a chance to process that if we break it down into small pieces with lots of breaks in between and look for the signs of processing, the licking and chewing, eyes blinking, sighing, tail flick, Sharon Wilsey stuff, then we are educating our horse with information and teaching him how to be a good learner and that he has actually a voice in the process. That horse is going to work for me in a way that a shutdown horse will never work for me. I love that, well done. No, I 100% I agree. And I think this is really about taking the time yeah. to even notice if you're, because each horse is different, right? So some horses, you, as you said, sack them out um, and they really don't mind. Their jaw doesn't get tight. Their ears don't go back. They, they aren't setting themselves like this. But other horses, you even walk up to them and then you've got to stop. When you see that reaction, just stop, Let put it on the ground, let them come to it, let them check it out, right? At their own speed, at their own time. Right. I love that. All right, here we go. Let's go back to Lil. You just have to, I think you were okay. You just were, your pointer was somewhere that wasn't where you thought. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, sometimes if you get that beeping, you just have to like check where you're pointing. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I told you you're my, you're my tech goddess. 
So one thing you mentioned, vagus nerve, and when Lily was finally really ready to be touched and helped, um, and I have to say the Misty staff has been working with her and she's, it's just amazing. I don't mean to say I was the only one. Um, here's Susie right here helping her. But you can see the pads are on the diagonal. The way we knew what she wanted is we gently touched the chestnut on the inside of her leg and let her decide which legs to pick up and, and where to be positioned. Because what happens with these um, help shut down horses, they'll lift their hoof just because they're so used to doing whatever you think, you know, whatever's the easiest, which is to just pick it up. So you wanna ask really politely and not force it or else you'll end up with the pads on the foot that isn't really helping them. She loves this diagonal pattern. Okay, but here, now this is what I, I wrote down, um, respectful, what did I say? Res I don't know. <laughs> respectful, indulgent grooming, I called it. Here's a video, because she finally showed me where she likes to be rubbed. Otherwise, I was just forcing her to get groomed for, you know what I mean? Um, here it is. You could kind of see she's soft, she's blinking, I'm very slow. I let her smell the brush first. And she could do this for a long time. And so it's not about cleaning the horse. It's about doing something that feels good to the horse. That's right. Just showing her I'm useful. I already showed you guys these. And then this is, this is yesterday. I ran over to the barn to try to get an after video. And this is Susie again working with her. And I hope you can see her ears swiveling and a little bit more softness. She's not rushing. She used to be a cart horse, so she would just bomb around. See how she's sort of curious? And what was really nice there was when she needed to look away, instead of Susie just yell, you know, yelling with the line not to do that, she allowed her that moment to look away and then asked her to come back. And you'll see that here because the door is where she's looking right so That's here right. I'm gonna look toward the door right about there right but so for a moment her mind went outside the door but what was so nice is Lu um susie gave her that second to give yes. her the opportunity to look and then she came back and i always say you know no person gives you a hundred percent of their attention when they're talking to you if somebody is then they're you know it's because there's a moment of extreme stress that something really bad is going to happen because we never in casual conversation give anybody a hundred percent and so here we're just saying okay we acknowledge that you're going to look out the door for a moment that's fine have your look and because you gave her that then she could keep going and i and i think when we're working with these types of horses it's really important to be willing to bend a little um, it doesn't mean let the horse run you over or take over but it does mean in that moment choose to say go ahead have your look because i know that you're thinking about the door and then can you come back and work with me um and so i think that's a fabulous moment to capture and just the difference in expression in her eye and her and her ears and her neck carriage too and her movement i mean there's a lot of differences here and also this is with the carriage whip the dressage whip that you know used to make her get really uncomfortable and look at the beginning look how long so susie asks and then she just waits because lily takes a lot of processing so she's gonna trot but she needs you to say trot and then she needs to take a few steps and think about it and susie doesn't get wound up and start um you know whistling the whip to, in the air and all of that so okay so you know i think what we're saying is that when you have a horse that has been shut down we we really have to back up a we have to go back to make sure do they know the letters of the alphabet and then b is there can you find some value in my presence that if i as the person am going to be near you can you find some value so it's sort of on us to be able to find something that they like just to get the conversation started and then we have to really make sure that there's no pain from previous experiences and we have to make sure that there's no um you know as a pain uh lack of understanding and um fear and the fear part we have to really be closely reading because so, horses that are shut down what i find is that when they start thawing which is what happens they come out of their freeziness their vagus shutdown and they start to thaw 
you have to be ready for bad things to come out. In other words, they put it all in a garbage can and I slap the lid on. And now you're saying, hey, who are you? And you crack the lid open and some yeah. horses go blah and they just let it all out and they yell at you and they scream, you know, scream in horsey way. You know, they're aggressive or they're nasty or they want to bite you or that. And that happens because they've been shut down that there is this moment you have to be ready to go through the whatever process that is going to happen when you take that lid off. Yes. Um, and, and it's not always, you know, not everyone is realizing that's going to happen or ready for it to happen. But if, if that's why it's so important to learn how to read that the horse is not present, that the horse is shut down. And, you know, you get thoroughbreds off the track that are shut down. Um, because they haven't been given a choice. Not all of them. I've seen thoroughbreds come off the track and in five weeks pack a five-year-old child happily. And I've seen other horses come off the track and never come right. And, you know, it's, there's no easy way to assess that at this point in time, whether the horse is going to be okay or not okay. Um, but it is something that people need to recognize that if you are going to take that lid off that garbage can, there may be a lot of crap in there that you have to be ready or have someone with you to help you, someone trained to deal with the stuff that comes out. Um, well, and I would say that the skill of animal communication makes such a difference. So when we mm. told Lily that's what the forceps was for, all of a sudden then everyone could really have an easy time with their back end and, you know, she understood. I'm going to start a, I'm starting a small group class, I think, um, for owners of horses that are shut down that, um, to try to follow them every two weeks for a bit so that people can, we can all zoom in together and talk about how it's going. And then I can do the animal communication. They can practice their skills because I think it does cut. I'm not saying that the lid. No, no, I, I agree with you that if we can have a different perspective on, on what's going on, it always helps us. And that's, that's the thing is it's, it's having another perspective that is so critical because sometimes we get so stuck in our perspective of being afraid because the horse is being aggressive or whatever, right? Um, so we have a couple questions. One is why did you touch the chestnut to lift the horse's foot? Okay, so, um, and just about that class with the shutdown horses, anyone can find me at LP Connections and let I me know. The, I typed it in the chat there. Yeah. Um, Okay, so that's just because uh, in her case, that's how they have, she learned to pick her hoof up. So I'm, I just, with other horses that don't do it that way, I would just gently ask them to lift their foot. You have much more um, experience with all of this. I just, I'm just saying ask gently. Um, but that is a technique. Um, if you have a horse that's difficult picking up the feet, that if you take the chestnut and give it a gentle twist, they will pick up their foot. Um, I'm not saying that that's how you should always pick up a foot, but if you sometimes, you know, if you have to have a horse that's really got its foot stuck to the ground and you have to do something with that foot, it is a way to get it to lift. Um, we have another question that I have adopted a therapy horse 16 years and this is so helpful. He doesn't seem shut down, but there's a lot of stuff in there. So it, they don't have to be completely frozen to have stuff. And it again, it's when we offer them a voice, and this is something I'm actually going to caution people about, because I can remember very early on in my career when I became a team practitioner of the Tellington Jones work, I was listening to the horses and they decided that I was a great place to dump stuff. Like, here are all my troubles in the world. You carry my troubles. And I would go home exhausted at the end of the day because they were like, hey, yeah, great. Somebody else has got my burden now. Um, and people do that too. But we don't have to take on their stuff. Um, and I work very much on just creating a, a boundary that I will listen, but I will not absorb. And I'm sure you have a lot of stuff to say about that in your animal communication classes. Because when we start to open those doors, um, yeah we have to also be able to say, uh, that's yours, that's not mine, at the end of the day. And they're so easily consolable. When I told her it was a forceps, right? So then you can get all this angst, but if you could just talk about it, they don't end the conversation angsty, right? 
Um, but it does look like um, we have another comment. You that's might be able to answer about chewing the chestnut. See that? Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Um, I have not heard of that one. Um, I'm wondering if there isn't like an acupuncture point or something near that that he's actually influencing and in and the or around the chestnut. I'd have to ask um, one of my acupuncture friends to find out. But that's the, I have not heard of that before. Um, I do want to tell one other story about a shutdown horse um, yep. because th this was. Um, it was back when I was teaching pony club and one of our pony club kids went off to summer camp and rode this horse and they jumped and jumped and jumped and jumped and everything was fantastic and she loved the horse. So she bought the horse and brought it home and did not jump for a while. And this is not unusual to see in some of these horses that have been jumped like this. Um, what happens is they decompensate and he decompensated to the point where we could not walk him over a garden hose. Yes. It just, just, he completely unraveled. He wasn't a, a dangerous horse by any means or anything else, but he, he completely unraveled and would not go over a garden hose, never mind any type of jump. Um, and so it's, um, it's just really important to keep in mind that when you go and look at a horse or you're shopping for a horse and you go into an environment where they say, oh yeah, he jumps 10 times you know, every day and he's great and he does the same routine. These horses, just like people, can become very routine into an environment. And then when you take them out of that environment, they're completely incapable of adapting to another environment and to another, you know, another job. Yep. Um, totally. And I, and I would say, though, if you're prepared to be patient, um, let me go back here. Um, so this is Hunter, remember 15 years as a jumping horse, then, you know, doesn't want to look at a jump when, when he was with his owner who gave him a break. But watch this when I, once he softened up, I'm just running over the jump at Liberty and look who wants to go with me. And I think that I, I just show that because I think that we need to be open on the long term that I think now Hunter really wants a job. Yeah, and it's, you know, again, it, um, it's whether or not, you, you know, if you don't have the skill set, and, and I have to say that in the 20 years since that experience, you know, there's so many more opportunities now to learn about other techniques that we can do with our horses with, um, you know, liberty work and body work and just new approaches to training and learning that we're really so much further ahead now in a, recognizing and B, having tools to deal with these types of horses. Um, it's just always important to realize that when you, when, you, when you go out to buy a horse, you don't know that horse's whole story. And you're totally. never going to hear the whole story from the person that you're talking to. Um, and so I always say that, especially with uh, adult women that are looking for horses, take a professional with you that you really, really trust and listen to their opinion because they're gonna be the ones, I, you know, like if you have this much experience, you're making your choice between this here and here, right? You know, and I had a rider um, not long ago in Costa Rica and she called herself an intermediate rider. Well, her range of experience was this and so she thought she was here, but I look at a range like this and she was here. Right. And so when you take a professional with you that you trust, and again, you know, um, their range of experience is so much greater that they can look at the same situation where you go, oh, everything's fine. And they're like, wait a second, maybe not fine. Yeah. So the more you can educate yourself and have the support team around you, just like the horses, um, right. to help you make good decisions because you want to have fun. That's the whole point of this. And you want your horse to enjoy the job that you want to do with your horse. And that's really important too. Um, let's, I think before, I know we're getting to the end, but do we have time to quickly go through some of the things like the pads and the, um, yeah. energy work and stuff? Okay. Let me go to that. All right. Um, we haven't had many questions. I don't know. Are we doing that good a job? <laughs> <laughs> um, here, let's just show this. This is just a horse on pads that's having... 
and experience. Watch his hind end. He's giving this to himself. Sorry that I, this was a message to you, Wendy, where people were saying hello. Oh. But hopefully you can see that this is, he's at liberty and he's rocking. Do you see that? And reorienting himself. And, and this is not unusual. Not all horses sway, but it's not unusual. And we've, we've all got our opinions as to what the swaying means, but it is a comforting things, thing when the horses are on the pads like this. It's a, it, they, they're finding something very pleasurable in that experience. We don't know exactly what. Yeah, and you can see how inner, right? Yep. How inner he is, okay. Now here is this hold that I love the one where you put your right hand on the sacrum and the left on the withers, and then you hold it until the horse licks and chews or yawns or drops their head. And it's just a lovely way to be with a horse. And then Wendy here, uh, we were working, this is mouse, right? No, this is um, Hyla Weaver's horse, um, Blue. A Blue, sorry. Sorry, Hyla, if she's watching. But here you have the heart hold, which I also love with your right hand down between the left front legs like that and the left on the withers. And while I'm holding this, this sort of sacral area, but it, it's and something I love the best is the horse's face because Blue um, came from Amish country and she was a rescue that Hyla adopted and hadn't planned on riding her till her other horse went lame. And then Blue became her, her main squeeze and Blue had all the kind of, um, patterns of being a cart horse with a very high head and neck and very quick choppy gates. And for her to be able to have that degree of softness with people around her, that was one of the things that was so special. Yeah. Um, I put in, this is unusual, but I put in the pasture paradise setup, which is just when you take a paddock and you leave them uh, along the edges and you don't let them in the middle. And this keeps them moving. And I find that horses that keep moving between hay nets, the water, the shelter, um, they, they relax themselves. And I, I don't know what, whether that's a vagus nerve thing, but it, it pays off when I energetically feel how horses are feeling when they're not just standing around at the, at the gate all day. Well, you have to realize horses are designed to move and their grazing pattern is designed, they're designed to graze and move and graze and move because there, there wasn't the lush fields like you know Joyce always says you know what we have now is they walk out and they stick their head down they eat a ton of chocolate right um so these these types of pasture paradises are so helpful to keep the movement component that is so necessary for horses um because they're not able to roam the plains the way you know the the mustangs are and so um anything we can do to keep them in motion is helpful to their health I also added this, Daisy Bacon came to the barn and, um, and put this beamer mat on Chardon. I just think you can see how far out he is with his eye that way. He stood there for so long just in this trance. I just think it's another way to move energy that then could bring a horse out of freeze and help them relax and get back into their body. So I threw it on there and I put her name on that, that initial sheet if anyone wants to get you know, more information. So I think that's, yeah, that's the end for me of my pictures. Awesome. Well, this has been just a great talk and I hope people have really enjoyed it because I, I think it's so important for us to realize that if we want someone, a horse that is going to take care of us, we need to consider that horse and its education in that it understands what we're asking and how to do what we're asking and that we make sure that we, uh, create a safe space for learning, and then educate, check that they really understand what we're asking, not just assume, right? And make sure there's no pain. And, that, and that's really the keys, whether it's a human or a horse, you know, the more reading I do about human education, and now that we have the pandemic and people are trying to educate their kids, homeschooling and different schooling systems and everything else, you know, we're struggling with these learning systems, but it, it, we can take all of this information that we're learning and we can apply it to educating a horse because it's the same, essentially, a horse is like a child. A child doesn't have the development of the frontal lobe and the horse will never have that frontal lobe. So just thinking about, you know, how to educate our children and our horses in a safe, positive, fun environment, I think is really, really key. I think 
too, for COVID and for the anxiety that everyone's feeling, there's nothing better. It's so selfish, but to stand with a horse at Liberty and connect, it's so grounding. It's just, if you do have a horse and you have the time, it's such a beautiful thing to be doing at this moment. And it's such a kindness. You know? Well, and I think it's important to make the time now. Yeah. You know, so much of, for me, so much of what the, this pandemic is about is changing our patterns. And the constraint that's imposed by the pandemic provides us with an opportunity to change, to look at our patterns, to make choices, and to do what we really truly want to be doing. So Laura, I want to thank you. This is a really fun and just terrific webinar. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us. And just remember you can find this and Laura's other um, webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Um, and tomorrow my guest is, is um, Patrick. Uh, I'm not even gonna try and say his last name. He's a Dutch dressage rider. Uh, it's gonna be at nine o'clock in the morning and we're gonna talk about training. So stay tuned nice. for that and we'll see you tomorrow. Great. And thank you again, everybody have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye.